Jesus. Oh, so much has happened in the last couple of days. High five somebody next to you and say it's the last night. Anybody ready to celebrate who he made you? Whatever you're believing for, whatever you're trusting God for, he's not finished with you yet. He's just getting started. Amen? He's just about to start. Hey, find somebody around you. Just hug them, love them, welcome them. Say, welcome. I'm so glad you came. Flash of light. Troubles come with out of warning to turn the day into the night. Oh, oh, oh. oh and everything is changing. Oh, oh, oh. The truth is still the same. just bust out of your seat or do something crazy which y'all were really calm you're saving it for the party I know what's happening you're saving it for the party well listen we've had an incredible time this week and um, th Thursday Friday this morning was amazing if you heard Pastor Pam and Christine they were un unbelievable so so good so so much has happened and um there's a couple of ladies, I just want to come up and share a little bit of what God has done for them in the last couple of days. And I'm looking for Megan. And so I'm going to invite Megan to come on up here. Here she comes. Y'all give a big hand for Megan. So she is new to Pensacola and she's going to tell you about that. But I just, um, I want her to share a little bit about what, what's been happening in her life and what God has just been doing for her. Hi everybody, it's great to see you tonight and I'm just so glad to be here. Let me tell you where I was a year ago. I was in a place that I didn't like anything around me. I didn't like my neighbors, I didn't like the neighbors' dogs, I didn't like myself, and I was okay with that, being in my little shield. And then Stephanie, my best friend, Stephanie Kent, invited me to come down here for this Priceless Women's Conference, and I made every excuse not to come. I mean, literally every excuse. I even made things up, tried to not come, and my husband said, I think you need to go. And it must have been bad for him to say that. So I came down here, and something even happened on the way here. I just cut the music off, I cut everything off, and God just showed up. 
And I realized that I had gotten to the end of myself and my struggle and my planning and all my effort to control what was going on around me. I had lost control completely and I was not a stable person. And I got here and God started showing up and revealing himself to me. And I said, God, I don't know what to do anymore. I need help. I opened my mouth and actually communicated to him. And I said, I need help and I don't know what you want me to do. And I feel out of place and I feel like I have not found my family or my tribe. And I just believe that there's something for me out there. And he spoke to me and he said, daughter, he called me daughter. And he said, I want you to move here to Pensacola, Florida. And I want you to become part of Jubilee. And I want to train you. And I want you to sit with me. And I thought, okay. My husband's never going to leave. God, ne he's never going to leave. So I went back home. God just absolutely wrecked me at the, the last priceless conference. I mean, turned me upside down, started shaking things off of me and out of me. So I go home and I'm like, I have this beautiful little spark inside of me. And I tell my husband, I think that um, God wants us to move to Pensacola. And I'm waiting for the shoe to fall. And he says, you know what, Megan, I think you're right. I said, there's my golden fleece right there, you know. And so we packed everything up a few months later. Literally, I felt like Abraham or something. We just left it all and came down here. There were nine of us in a two-bedroom apartment for an entire month. Didn't have jobs or anything. And God showed up in a great way. He gave my husband a job. He got my kids in school. And then he showed me this process that he had for me. I, didn't, I was scared. I didn't know what to do. I have a lot of religion inside of me. He's delivering me from that. And he told me that I get to just be a daughter in his house. And I don't know what it was like to be a daughter until now. And I'm still in this process and I don't ever want to quit. And he's delivering me and he's healing my family. He's healing my marriage. He's healing my children. And I don't have to worry about our provision or the things in the future because I'm starting to get to a place that I'm like, you know what? You love me and you are my daddy. And I can truly lean and trust in you. You are not only enough, God, but you are more than enough. So I just want to say thank you, church. Thank you for being my family. And I'm glad you all are here. This has been awesome. And I love her hair. She does hair. So I was like, can you make my hair look like that? She's like, you can buy it. <laughs> um, where is Christine? Come on up. So Christine has been on a journey in, in her life recently. And um, I'm going to let her share something because we've been talking a lot about identity this weekend. And you've heard it over and over, and Pam said it this morning to the group of young women, that she said, I picked these young girls because if we could have only known, you know, earlier in life, so many things that no one took the time to tell me. And Christine just had a story around that, and she came up and shared it with me, and I wanted her to share it with you. I'm sure it's not a big surprise to any of you, but... I was in prison for two and a half years. And it was a very hard, hard journey for me. But I realized God put me there for a reason. It was to mentor many of those women. I say those women, but they came to be my women at the end of that journey, which still continues today. But I had the privilege of mentoring these women and one of the things that I made them do when I heard all their stories and they kind of felt at the beginning that I was an outsider, that I had a fairy tale life because they would see my husband and my children and come visit me and nothing was lacking. It was funny, but I had the best bed. I had so many things that 
God had given me inside this pit of my life that they couldn't understand what was happening. So I told them, it's not a fairy tale life. It's a God-given life. Because there are things that we cannot change. We cannot change the place where we were born. We can't change our parents, our siblings. We can't change the time in history that we were born. Okay? There's so many things we can't change because we were designed by a master. And I thank God for that fairy tale life because it is a fairy tale life. Okay? And one of the things I told them to do, because they had a lot of regrets, a lot of bitterness. And I'm talking drug addicts, prostitutes, I mean, murderers. This is bad stuff, okay? Things that really would shake our life. It shook mine. It totally shifted my thinking. And I told Angela today, with my husband's ministry, when we would go to Africa, I could take only so much. I could see the bitterness, I could see the need, and I could only take so much. But after four or five days, I could get on that airplane, and I could come back to my air conditioning. I could come back to all of my shoes, okay? I couldn't do that for two and a half years. I had to just suck it up and take it and make the best of it. And God made it one of the best experiences of my life. What I ask these women to do is write a letter to their younger self. And I'm gonna read you mine. I've never taken it out of the way I've written it. I left it in my handwriting so I would know I wrote it from my heart to myself. And I'm going to read it to you. I've never shared it with anybody outside my family except with these women. So I hope you don't get offended. If I could give my younger self just one piece of advice, it would be this. Stop being so afraid. That's really what strikes me when I look back. The sheer amount of time I spent tangled up in fears and doubts that were entirely of my own creation. I was afraid of not knowing the answer in class or getting a bad grade on a test. I worried about some boy, what he thought of me, or if the other girls liked my clothes or my hair. Or angsting about some offhand comment someone made to me or not making my parents proud. If I could go back in time, I would tell my younger self, Christina, these years are just a tiny blip in your life. And all the slights and embarrassments and heartaches, all of that is not important in the grand scheme of things. Instead, what matters are the true friends you make, the activities you throw yourself into, the books you read, the skills and knowledge you acquire, the company you keep, and most of all, your relationship with God. Those experiences, the, one that's, the ones that make you stronger, smarter, and braver, are what really matter. So I would have told myself, Walk away from relationships that make you feel small and insecure. And seek out people who inspire and support you. You're a smart girl. And you know what you want. Remember, your mouth is not a trash can. Neither is any other part of your body. You were created to be loved, cherished. I lost my place. Hold on a minute. And taken care of. And when that special someone comes along, he will be the one who gives you your heart's desires. Focus more on learning than on succeeding. Money does not produce happiness, but it produces something so similar that only an expert can tell it apart. Don't be greedy. Be wise. Know where your pennies go 
So you'll know where your dollars are. And once in a while, splurge to keep your soul happy. And for heaven's sake, let yourself fail once in a while. Not some tiny little mistakes here and there, but big, glaring, confidence-shaking, dark night of the soul-inducing failures. Understand that no one, especially folks who are truly successful, simply coast from achievements to achievements. On life's journey, attitude is everything. Make some bold moves. In short, stop trying to be someone who will impress everyone else and just focus on being and becoming fully, sincerely, and passionately yourself. That was awesome. Don't we all wish we had a letter like that written to us? Well, I want to leave you with this little, um, a couple of little points that I want to share with you that I hope is going to seal all the things that God has been doing over the last couple of days. And if you'll just bear with me about 15, 20 minutes, and then we're going to head out and party. So just hang with me. But in 2 Corinthians, it's funny because um, Pastor Pam opened this morning with the scripture that I was going to preach last night, and now I'm going to share it again with you today. But in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 16, it says this. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And I believe that part of what God has been doing this week, with this weekend, has been taking the veil from in front of some of our faces. The veil that we put there for what other people, we don't want them to see, or the veil that we put there because we don't want to see what's in front of us. But I believe that God has been removing that veil. And he just began to talk to me about that. And he said, you know, Angela, there's something about identity that brings true freedom. There's something when we really know who we are and we can walk in a confident identity in who we are, not perfect, but confident, that there is freedom in that. And I believe what has happened over you in the last few days, whether you recognize it or not, whether it's fully shown up on your life or not, it's about to. Because identity is going to bring freedom in some areas of your life. And to really discover who I am, I have to remove those things that get in the way. So when you leave here this weekend, you have a little bit of work to do because you're going to leave here all high and excited and woo, and then you're going to go right back to the reality of where your real world is. And the real world is still what you left on Wednesday and Thursday. But God's about to transform some of those places. But I believe there's some stuff that you've got to move out of the way when you leave here this weekend. There are some things that go in here and here that you need to remove. There are some things that you need to shift what you spend your time doing. And if I could use the word focus, and I asked Jaden, I don't know if she has that camera somewhere. Um, but there's something about, and I'm a terrible picture taker. How many of you are really great at taking pictures? I need you in my world. Um, thank you. So, this is probably a really expensive camera, so I hope I don't drop it. Um, yeah, everyone hope I don't drop the Canon. But when you look through a camera lens, maybe I could get a podium or something down here. That would be awesome. Um, when you look through a camera lens, what's the first thing you do? Focus. Look at somebody and say, Focus. See, I only use my iPhone camera, so it focuses by itself. It makes the little yellow square, 
it gets whatever it's looking for, and it does all the work for you. What happens if you don't focus? Thank you. It's blurry. Oh, kind of like a veil over your face. Right? It's like taking a picture. I'm being careful. It's like taking a picture through a veil. And, and if you don't focus in that camera, then when I develop or print out the picture that I took, it's not clear. And I want to challenge you that when you leave, that you need to remove some things and that you need to begin to focus on what is going to, what you want to develop out of your life. Because if we go back and we focus on the same things that we always have, you're going to develop the same pictures. And that's part of your identity because what you produce is what you look like on the inside. And so I was thinking about taking pictures and you know, there's, there's a transformation of that that has to start with you. And if you focus on the wrong thing, then that's what you produce. And here's what we do. We take our, our life camera, if you will. And I want Christine and my mom to both be in the picture. So I pull it up like this, but I can only see Christine in the picture right now. And the problem is, that I won't move, I expect her to move. But who really needs to move for them to both be in the picture? If I want that image, I'm the one who's gotta move. So I gotta focus and I've gotta change my position. Because if I'm walking in a new identity and I understand who I am as an original design of God, then it's my job to reposition myself out of a place of insecurity, out of a place of fear, out of these places and say, hey, I'm going to move and I'm going to get the image that God said in my focus. That's what God wants us to begin to do because listen, what you're focused on is the image that you will produce. And for some of us, we've got to reposition ourselves and that's why Megan's testimony to me was so important. Because if, if God said to some of you today, I want you to pick up and just move somewhere or do something crazy like that, you'd be like, no. I have established this and this and this. That would be, whoa, that'd be way too much. But just think if you took the risk to do what God said. And you were confident enough in who he is on the inside of you. And you could reposition yourself and focus yourself on what looks impossible. What you would develop is the possible out of your life. And the reason our focus is off a lot of times is because we want everybody else to change. We want everybody else to move. We want everybody else to do whatever it is they do. And God's like, no, baby, I need you to move. No, baby, I brought you to a conference like this because I wanted to change something in you. Somebody say, it starts with me. You're like, oh, Angela, you're supposed to be nice. I try. It just doesn't come out of me like that. I try. But the truth is, you got to be determined enough. And I said that this morning to come out to be willing to change something on the inside of you. Not, hey, if she would move over, or hey, if my husband will act like that when I get home, then I'll be okay. If my kids would quit acting like that, if my boss would not do that, if I could just get the promotion that I deserve that they won't give me. But at the end of the day, you gotta reposition yourself, you gotta change. Because mindsets have to change. Because until it's not about you, you will never really know who you are anyway. It has to be completely about who God is in you. It's not everything else has to change to fit my agenda. We've got to change to fit His agenda. And I just, I just believe that God is going to give you such a tenacity when you leave here to go and to focus and reposition yourself. And what's going to come out of that is like those mirrors you saw in that dance on Friday night, your reflection is about to change and what you reflect is about to change. 
See, people know you in this uh, certain identity, and sometimes we think of reflection as only what I see myself. But there is a type of reflection when they were putting the mirrors up on Friday night, and some of you had light in your face. Remember that? It was like, whoa, hey, I wish they'd move that. That's the kind of reflection you need to be. Oh, man, I wish she would get out of my business. I wish she would quit messing. Oh, I, I, I would. And you've got to become that person that brings change wherever you are. And that's the kind of reflection that God wants you to, to come off of you. Can I ask you this question? What are you reflecting in your life? What do you reflect to the people around you? What do you reflect to your boss? Are you the best worker, the hardest worker, the one that he knows that he would call on because there's such an integrity and a character on the inside of you? Is that what you reflect? What do you reflect to your husband? Do you reflect that he never does it right, he's always wrong, he's always on the couch? Oh wait, that was my husband this afternoon, sorry. He's, he's always, he'll never, he's always, he'll never, they'll never. What are you reflecting? God wants to change what you're reflecting out of your life so that you reflect Him. You know, there's this, there, is, there is something about pictures, and I've shared this before, but it was funny because Jadine and I were having a talk one day, and, and I said, man, I just, man, I look so fat in that picture. We were looking at a picture, and she said, yeah, I had a friend all the time that said, well, pictures don't lie, honey. And I'm like, wait, you're supposed to tell me. No, you don't. You look good in that picture. You look so pretty. But the truth is, whatever we reflect is what we reflect. And God wants to change the mirror in front of me. Remove that veil. Get rid of the distorted view. Get rid of that. Get rid of the distorted reflection that's coming off of me. And become His image like you've never been before. So that's my challenge to you as you leave this weekend. Because let me tell you something, you're going to leave on a high. Y'all are going to, we're going to have to shut y'all down at like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock tonight. We'll be like, girls, we got church. We have to go. We're going to have to shut it down. But when that happens, and when you go back to your world, I want you to see a picture of a camera in your head. Taking a picture of who you are and what you're reflecting. And I want you to begin to think about the areas you need to reposition yourself. And what are the areas you've been focused over here, but you need to be focused over here? I've been focused on all the negative of this thing. Oh, but I I need to focus over here. I need to quit saying what isn't and start saying what is. I need to start speaking what wasn't and what is about to be. I need to start speaking what I don't see to what I am going to see. And God's going to let you attach your faith. And I believe he's going to bring the focus of your original identity to life. And I hope that that you let that seal something on the inside of you. And I hope that when you go out and you party and we have fun tonight, and we celebrate who we are as women, all individual, our very own originals, every one of us. But when you go home, you remind yourself that's still who you are. No matter where you find yourself, that's still who you are. And I have a little declaration that um, I wanted us to do together. I I need to hand some out. I have a little gift for you really quickly before we do that. So I'm going to ask the ladies if you guys would just get those ready. And um, I don't care if you have a bracelet on or not. I want everybody just to have one of these. And... um, There's a young lady, a lot of you know her. She used to be a nanny for Jasmine when she was little. And um, her name is Becky Youngblood. How many of you know Becky? She couldn't be here for this conference. But about several weeks ago, she sent me a text crazy early in the morning, which, listen, I wasn't even awake. I got it like an hour later. And she said, Angela, I think that you should get with some of the women that you lead and you all should all write something about being original. And you should create something that the women can take with them from that place. So in a very quick manner and with Craig Lawrence as the hero of all things graphic and and being working great under pressure, 
he um, helped me and Trey did a, a couple of the graphics in here as well, help create this little journal. And it's not all that, I know that. But what it is, is it's the heart of something. If you look through here, there are about five or six devotionals that were written by some of the women in this house that have learned what it means to be an original. And all the blank pages in between are your chance to write down the rest of this year who you are to Jesus, who he sees you as, what you reflect, what you're focused on, who God says that I am. And every time there's something contradictory to that, I challenge you to write what God says in this little book. And say, no, that's not who God says I am. No, I'm not that. No, I'm not that. God says I'm this. And you need to write it down and speak it over yourself. Because there's not a prophetic meeting that follows you around in your life, but there is someone called the Holy Spirit who does. And I just encourage you to take this little book with you and begin to write down the things that God has spoken to you this weekend. And go, I put in the beginning, go on a journey, go on an identity journey with yourself. If we had the time right now, I would have you all write a letter like Christine just read in this book. I encourage you to do that. Write a letter to your younger self that ministered to me. And when I knew we were handing out these journals today, I was like, oh my goodness. She didn't even know that. But maybe that's how you need to start. What would you say to your younger self straight off the bat? And then start living that. But this is something I hope blesses your life. And it's something of substance of what has come out of this that you can take with you. And I hope it really ministers life back to you. And I have one other thing that I want us to do before we go out to the after party. And I hope another thing that you'll do with this, let me mention this, is pray over these women that we've been praying for all weekend that we're going to continue to pray for that are going to get these hope bags that Karina's been talking about in the Prices Project. These women that are about to get rescued from somewhere that you and I would probably never find ourselves. And I hope that they discover who they are. I'm, we may even put one of these in those bags with them. But I have a little declaration for you. And I don't know if you guys have that ready back there. But I want to do a declaration, all of us together, before we go out. And I just believe, I hope it just sends you with some sort of explosion in your spirit about who you are. Can you all just stand up with me right where you are? I don't even know what time it is. Am I on schedule? It doesn't really matter because I've taken over the being. I am repositioning myself. As, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but they're going to put the words up here. And I just want us to declare this together. I want you with everything within you. And I'm not a big read the words and repeat person. Because I'm kind of like, seriously, I can do it myself. I can whatever. But there's going to be something that I believe is going to get on the inside of you when you start speaking these words over yourself. Are you ready? So we're going to declare this all together. I am original. Come on, we're going to just read this thing. I am who he says I am. I have everything he says I have. I will be who he says I will be. I am a reflection of him. Come on. I am made in his image. I am beautiful. I am strong. I am smart. I am successful. I am a friend. I am the real deal. I am authentic. I am happy. I am loving. I am one of a kind. I am his original. Come on and high five somebody next to you. All of those are words that have been said throughout the weekend. They were like, have you written it yet? I said, no, I'm waiting until I hear what everybody says and I'm going to write it down. And I just believe those are words that came out of the atmosphere of this conference. And on the way out, they're going to give you a card that has that printed up on it. And I want you to take it and put it in that journal. And I want you to read this over yourself and you remind yourself who you are. All right? You guys feel like original, priceless women in this place? Are y'all ready to go to an after party? Well, get out of here.
there. Go party. We'll see you outside. You're originals. And we're still at home.